All right, listeners, we are in for a treat because our guest this week is a senior fellow at Duke University's Case Center, the founder of ThinkWell, and a four-time New York Times bestselling author. Please help me welcome Dan Heath. I'm so delighted you're here, especially after listening to you at Work Human Live London. I've been looking forward to this for weeks. Hey, thanks. So before we jump into the actual content, we are Work Human and we believe in the humanity of every person. So we like to start out by talking first about the person instead of talking first about what they do. So please introduce yourself beyond your credits and your accolades, and tell us, please, a little bit about the human that is Dan Heath. Ah, the human. Well, I think it's a pretty simple story, really. From a professional perspective, there are really only four things that I I like to do and have any skill at, and that's research, write, speak, and teach. So I, I try to stay somewhere in those four lanes in most of my time at work. And then At home, I have a wife and two young daughters, and I'm a bit of a homebody. So if if I'm not doing those four things, then I'm probably at home hanging out with them. And that's it. Yeah, simple life. (laughs) There's something to be said for that. Love it, love it, love it. And I'm also a researcher, so you're speaking my language, which is probably part of the reason that I loved your talk and that I love your books. Thanks. Thanks so much. My brother and I put a lot of a lot of work and a lot of love and a lot of conversation into those books. So it's nice to find people with a like mind. You know, you can tell that there's a lot of love and thought and care that goes into it. It really, really shows. So let's get into it. Let's talk about this idea of moments that matter. That's a concept that resonates deeply for us as a company. But could you introduce our listeners and our audience to that idea? What are moments that matter? Yeah. So let me start actually one step zoomed out from there. I think the starting place for this book is in the word experience. We live in a world where we're increasingly paying attention, not just to products and services, but to the experience people have as customers, as employees, as patients, as students. And so the starting place for the book was, what can we do to craft better experiences for the people we care about? And very early in that search or that exploration, we figured out that to make an experience better is not really about making every single moment in an experience better by some incremental amount. Like I remember... I think it was a a hospital CEO or administrator was talking about that they were trying to ramp up the patient experience and they were going to focus on everything from the check-in process to making sure that the nurse's white shoes were sparkling clean because that was a symbol of the overall. And I remember thinking like, no, that's not it. To make things better doesn't mean everything has to be 10% better. And in fact, the research is pretty clear on this, that if you look at the kinds of experiences that people cherish and that people find meaningful, it's really about making some moments a lot better. The language we use in the book that we have borrowed from psychology is the language of peak moments. So when people look back on their experiences, they don't store those experiences up like videos, you know, and just replay them end to end. Most of what we experience dissolves And what we're left with are just certain specific scenes or snippets or moments. And those are the peak moments that we talk about in the book. So in other words, to make an experience better, what we need to start doing is paying a lot more attention to the peak moments that can provide the pillars or the foundations of that experience. Awesome. So how does one go about, like when you have an experience that lasts a long time, like your tenure at an organization, How does one go about deciding what are the opportunities to create some of those peaks? Yeah, great question. And to be clear, this is not settled science. So if you told me, you know, somebody's going to work at an organization for 15 years, like how many peaks should there be and when should they be? Like, that's all extrapolation, not a RCT, a randomized control trial. But I'll tell you the best of my own judgment is 
Number one, there are certain moments that demand our attention because they're unusually important to the people involved. And an example of that would be transition points, the beginnings and endings of an experience. So one of the things we talk about at great length in the book as an example of a transition point is the first day at work. And from a psychology point of view, this is such a no-brainer as a moment of focus because it's just a massive transition in the lives of the people starting a new job. It's a physical transition, you know, new place. It's a social transition working with new people. It's an intellectual transition working on new kinds of assignments. And yet from the employer side of the ledger, it's often treated just as some kind of bureaucratic chore. Like, oh, well, Heath is starting today. Uh, Somebody round up his badge so he can get in the building and let's get his email account set up. And it's like, check, check, check. And meanwhile, to me, I'm having those like third grader in a new school emotions of anxiety. And am I going to like this? Am I going to fit in? Am I going to remember anybody's name? And so we tell the story in the book of John Deere, which created this kind of masterful first day experience. And to me, that's a perfect example of how to make this idea practical about peak moments, that not every moment's going to be a peak and not every moment needs to be a peak. But if you look at the moments that are of unusual importance, like the transition moments, we have the ability to be intentional about this and to be thoughtful and basically create a peak out of thin air. So yeah, I think that's kind of a, the John Deere accomplishment is a nice inspiration for all of us about how we can spin this around and be thoughtful about it. I love everything about that answer. First of all, I am a John Deere fan. When I was part of the Mayflower Survey Consortium, I got to work with them and understand some of the more innovative things they're doing. And you would never expect it from a tractor company, right? (laughs) Which, (laughs) to your point, should inspire all of us. But also, I like that you're talking about the first day experience, because this is something I talk about and think about a lot. Because I see a lot of organizations make the same mistake that you just outlined, right? They think about what do we need tactically Mm. from the employee to get them going instead of what does the employee need to feel in order to make them more engaged with this organization and to feel welcomed. And so we talk a lot about the role of recognition in creating that kind of experience and that kind of feeling that makes people more likely to stay with their organization. And we see that reflected in the research as well. So people who are recognized within their first year are much more likely to stay versus people who are not. Amen. Yeah. Yeah. I think it's just, it is kind of weird that we, it's like we have a widget based view of people sometimes, you know, and it's like, well, we have this new asset. We've got to snap it in and activate it as quickly as possible. But we miss the whole emotional layer of of what does it feel like to be the new kid on the block and how can we be as welcoming as possible? How can we make sure the person has a a friend or a mentor or, or, you know, some connections as quick as possible? And so, yeah, that's our chance to put a stamp on the experience. I've had people push back and say, well, if you create some dazzling day one experience, like how do you keep that going on day two and day three? And I'm like, that's not really the expectation. We're not in the dazzling bit. We're not in the entertainment business of dazzling our employees every day. The point is, this is a vulnerable point and it deserves attention. And day one is different than day two. And day one is certainly different than day 78. And so I think it's sort of funny that people deter themselves from doing something great on day one because they don't want to keep it up forever when I think that's an expectation of precisely no one. (laughs) I would definitely agree with you. So in our research, we found that people hired during the pandemic really suffered. And we tended to see that they were more likely to leave the new org and go back to a previous org than people who were not hired during the pandemic. So one of the things WorkHuman did that I love when I was hired at WorkHuman in 2020, before my day one, They sent me a box of swag, which, you know, that is nice in and of itself. So I had my work human coffee cup in advance of day one, ready for my Mm -hmm. Zoom meetings. But you open the box and it said, you are just the human we have been looking for. Like, I wish they had a camera in the box because my face, I just thought it was so great. Yeah, that's brilliant. That's brilliant. And it's, um, it's a lot harder to do this remotely. I've had a lot of conversations during the pandemic where it's like, well, how do we do this peak moment stuff remotely? And it's not that it's impossible. I do think it's possible. 
But let's not kid ourselves either. Being face to face with another human is just a different thing than messaging them or being on an online communication platform or some kind. And, and it is a lot harder. And I believe for the sake of both the employers and the employees, we should be encouraging more face-to-face and not less. But probably a lot of people are going to bristle at that. <laughs> <laughs> so I do want to talk about that in a second. So I'm glad you brought that up. But before you do that, I want to round out this topic because we talked about beginnings But in your book, you also talk about endings. So I would love for you to tell our audience about the senior signing day, the example that you gave in your Mm -hmm. book, but also give us some inspiration around how we think about endings in organizations, because I think we're making a mistake not giving it as much attention as beginnings. Yeah, I completely agree with you. Yeah. So let me tell the the signing day story, which is maybe my favorite story in the whole book. And then we can come back to how does that translate for a typical corporation, for instance. So the signing day story starts with two friends in Houston, Texas, uh, two guys named Donald Comence and Chris Barbick, who were the founders of Yes Prep, which is a charter school district in Houston. And they were starting up a whole school district by themselves at that point which was like a 14 hour a day kind of job as administrators. And so they would go to this one pub in Houston every night to recover from the day. And one night they were there and they were watching the footage of signing day on ESPN. So signing day is the day when football players who are going on to college declare where they're going to commit, where they're going to play college ball. And so it's a big deal. It gets all this hoopla on ESPN. And so Chris and Donald were watching this on TV and bemoaning the fact that athletes get so much of this attention and acclaim. And and meanwhile, the kinds of students that they were serving who were predominantly students from low-income Hispanic families, many of whom would be the first to graduate from high school and almost certainly the first to go on to college if they did. And so they were saying, don't our students deserve the same kind of attention and credit and and honoring? And and so at first it was a, a story of frustration for them. But eventually, in that same conversation, it clicked for them, wait a minute, why don't we create a moment like that for our students? Why don't we create a moment that holds them up and celebrates them? And that was the birth of what's become known as Senior Signing Day. So it started at Yes Prep, but it's actually spread around the country since. And the structure is very similar if you look at it across schools, and it started this way at Yes Prep. Every senior has his or her moment on stage. And they've often brought some kind of swag from the school that they're planning on attending in the fall, the college. And so maybe it's a pennant or a baseball cap or or something like that. And and they'll hold it up. They'll have their chance solo to go up to the microphone and, and announce themselves. Hi, my name is Dan Heath. This fall, I'll be attending University of Texas at Austin. And everybody will cheer and applaud and the students will get this huge smile on their face and just have a moment to just bask in the recognition. And it's just a beautiful ceremony. And Chris and Donald, the first time they tried this, it was a small class, 17 people. They had a room full of their loved ones, but also every other student in the district from sixth graders up to juniors in high school, because they wanted them to get a taste early on of what it was like to scale the mountain, you know, what it was like to graduate from high school and to have academic aspirations afterwards and and the acclaim that went with that. And so... Chris Barbick told me after the first time, they knew this was going to be the most important day of the year forevermore at Yes Prep. And then what happens is as the district grows in Houston, they keep having to move into bigger and bigger venues as their senior class expands and as they add more schools. And when I saw this ceremony back in 2000, what was it? 2016, I guess. It was in the Toyota Center in Houston, Texas. So exactly the same ceremony. Every senior gets their moment on stage. But the biggest difference is now when they look out, there are 10,000 people cheering for them. And this story, I wish I could show you the video on this podcast because it will bring a tear to your eye. It is is such a beautiful, thoughtful, aspirational moment. And it just, I can never get enough of the fact that this moment, which will become a defining moment lifelong moment for the students that are part of it, something they will look back on 50 years later, was just invented. I mean, out of whole cloth by two friends at a pub one night because they thought their students deserved it. And to me, that's almost symbolic with 
the aspirations that my brother and I have for this book is just to remind people we have the ability to create these peak moments if we just find the right occasion and do the legwork needed to bring them to life. I love that example. And the part of the story in the book that I also love that you didn't mention was the part about including all the students that were not graduating Mm. and the example of someone who may have been a, pardon me if I get this wrong, because I didn't grow up in this country. And so (laughs) the language is a little different. I think she was a sophomore Mm -hmm. and she said she remembered looking at that stage at people that graduated And thinking that one day she wants to be on that stage. And she was Mm. eventually. Mm -hmm. And there is a saying going around representation matters. And we say that all the time. But I think we don't often stop to think about what that means in real life. And this is an example of that in real life. I see somebody like me with circumstances similar to me doing something that now I feel like I can do as well. Well said. And that was very explicitly what was on their mind, because in a different world, this could have just been a celebration of seniors just for them and their families. You could imagine that being the way this was architected. But they wanted to bring in the younger students for for the reasons you share, because they wanted to start molding and really growing their aspirations to see that people from my neighborhood who look just like me are going on to bigger and better things. And why not me? So now I'm going to ask a provocative question. (laughs) Should organizations do something similar when people leave and go to other places? What do you think? Yeah, I haven't thought much about the leaving to go other places. Let me mull that one. But I did come across a great ending ceremony. This was at an, an accounting firm and their partners who are retiring I do think we recognize that we'll buy a sheet cake for someone or something and wish them well in their last week. But the way they did it, I thought was so artful that it was inspiring to me. So they had their annual conference and at the annual conference, they had a time to celebrate partners who are retiring. And so the way it would work is another partner would get up and tell their career life story. Like, you know, it didn't start at birth and go through elementary school or anything, but it was just reviewing their tenure at the organization and some of the highlights. And part of it was career highlights. Part of it was jokiness. Like it was a mixture of a, of a wedding toast and a eulogy in tone. And then the retiring partner themselves, they would have a chance to come up and give some remarks. And then everybody would toast them with champagne at the end. And I just thought like, what a great punctuation mark after a long career. And it made me think that they're It's almost the same story as what we were talking about with signing day, right? It's like there's tremendous value for the retiree in achieving a point of closure. But I think it's also interesting to think what effect does it have for the other people in the room? Because it's a signal of the values of the organization. It's like this is an organization that cherishes its employees enough that even at the moment when they're going away and quote unquote, not adding value anymore, they're still worthy of attention and acclaim and honoring. And I think that's a powerful signal to send. I love that you've thought about it that way in terms of not only what does that do for the person, but what does that do for the witnesses? And we Mm -hmm. talk about that a lot. Now that I'm reflecting on this, JetBlue did something similar for my ending there, which was great. So I left because I wanted more global experience. So I went to a company that was a lot more global than JetBlue and they threw me a party and Mm. my co-workers put together this photo book of all my memories at JetBlue and people contributed. Yeah, I still have it displayed in my house. People contributed all their favorite Misha Anism. So one of the things I'm known for is snapping instead of clapping. And I'm still a JetBlue brand ambassador today. I still, they happen to be a client of WorkHuman, still have deep relationships there, still speak fondly of that brand and my experience there. It's so good. And it's a reminder that to me, one of the most important concepts in the book is the idea of responsiveness that what drives memorable moments is often a quality of responsiveness. And we're using that word in the way that a researcher who has spent his career studying relationships used it. And he says that if you look at what causes relationships to grow deeper, 
it's really three things. It's understanding, validation, and caring. So somebody understands us and what we aspire to and what we want, but they don't just stop there. They validate us in the sense that they signal that they respect the choices we're making. And then finally, they care for us, understanding, validation, and caring in the sense that they're willing to exert effort to help us get to those things. And so that's what responsiveness is, according to Harry Reese, this social psychologist. And the reason I bring that up is because when I talk to people about moments and especially creating moments, a lot of times their mind goes towards produced moments. Disney World, let's create a, a great show for the guests that is memorable and ends with fireworks. And, and it's not that that's not a peak moment. I do think there are a lot of great produced peak moments in the world. But when you're thinking about work and when you're thinking about relationships and years worth of tenure, it's not going to be those produced moments probably that linger. It's going to be the, the human moments. And so like what JetBlue did, for instance, was something highly responsive. You know, it was all about you. It was about their memories of you custom curated for you. And even if they used that same structure for somebody else, like even if somebody else who left also got a photo book, it doesn't really undermine the responsiveness of your treatment. And I think that's part of what makes experiences memorable to us is when we feel like we were seen and understood and attended to in that way. I love that. We talk about some of these same ideas when we think about recognition, we did some research with Gallup about what makes recognition impactful. And the tenant that comes to mind that aligns with what you just said is individualized. Mm -hmm. I want this to be for me. I want this to be clear that this is not something generic, but this is something specifically curated for me. That's it. Yeah, I love that. And it's it reminds me of, we had a moment of awakening on this project, uh, Chip and I, where we had just done a very simple survey to fish for people's defining moments as they interpreted them in their career. It was very open-ended. We were just interested to learn like what kinds of stuff are people bringing up. And we start getting these responses back. And I remember at first being sort of disheartened because some of them seemed really mundane. Like the, I'm just paraphrasing, but one of them that sticks in my mind was like, and remember, the prompt here is, what was the defining moment in the last, say, year of your work? So red letter days. This person said, I was really appreciative of the fact when my boss commended me for organizing the bikes in the back room, and he called me out and said how much that had helped. And, and, and so I thought, oh, well, that's just a fluke. And then I, I go on to another one, and it's like, well, one day I solved a problem for a customer and the customer is so happy they called out my boss. And I think my boss praised what I had done and my improvisation. And, and then I start to realize, no, this is what peak moments sound like. It's not giving the TED talk on stage in Las Vegas to 2000 people. You know what I mean? It's like, no, somebody that I care about recognized me and paid attention to what I did. And so we did a 180 in, in thinking about the book and realizing, hey, Peak moments are not all big and splashy and creative. They're often small and human and tailored. And so that, just to reinforce everything you said about recognition, the line that sticks with me, this is from an academic paper, is that what recognition is ultimately about is not the awards, not the plaques, not the $20 Starbucks gift cards. It's just the simple statement, I saw what you did and I appreciate it. That's it. That's the magic. I saw what you did and I appreciate it. I love that. And as a researcher, if you think about it later, you can email me that academic paper. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, <laughs> I yeah. I love those. <laughs> okay, so let's get back to something you mentioned before about the importance of people being face-to-face. -face. Apparently, a lot of companies agree with you because they're trying to get employees back to the office. So are there any moments you think that organizations can create to make in-person meetings feel like a choice and something that we go for of our own volition rather than a policy or something that somebody else is making us do that we don't want to do. Mm -hmm. Yeah, this is tricky. I saw the article in the, the New York Times within the last week. It was like, even Zoom is asking people to come back to the office, which is, which is a sign of the times. So the short answer is, I don't know. This is new stuff, new times, but I do know what the shape of the answer is going to look like. And I think, number one, we've got to resist the urge 
to kind of be stagey or producey about this. So in other words, like what's going to get people back to the office is not like, Ugly Sweater Fridays or, or something like that. You know what I mean? It's not going to be the corny kind of stuff that feels eventy and feels momenty, but it's actually sort of a sideshow. Like, I think what's going to get people back to the office willingly and by choice is something that's organic to the work. Like, if you think about what is worst about the work from home experience, it's there are certain kinds of work that are just too clumsy and cumbersome to do that way. If you think about when people are collaborating at their best and like just call up a mental model of what that time was like, for a lot of people, it's like there are people together in the same room. A lot of times in my experience, people are remembering situations where there's like something they're looking at together. You know, maybe it's a flow chart on a whiteboard or or maybe it's a prototype of a new product or it's the release map for, for some piece of software. And it's like everybody is looking at the same thing and assessing it and talking about it and it's collaborative and it's visual and and there's a sense of progress and importance and you can kind of move things around you're moving post it notes or you're redrawing lines and and there's just no way that you can easily simulate that online like that is like it's something palpable and so i think if i were the the boss of some big corporation it's like you can get a double win by Number one, I genuinely think teams are at their best when they have a lot of that kind of interaction as opposed to lobbing emails back and forth and it's synchronous, collaborative work. And I think the double word score is that because it's so much better done in person, it also becomes a lever to encourage people to come back to the office. So that's my theory of the case. What's yours? I love that answer, actually. And I agree with you that we need to be thoughtful about which work is done at home and which work is done in the office. And I think that Mm -hmm. you've nailed that appropriately. But to just get a little bit more whimsical about it, I think it can't hurt if you incorporate food, you know, (laughs) like (laughs) it's okay. So you don't want to give like a pizza party for recognition or something like that. But at Work Human, we do something called Waffle Wednesdays. Mm. And I think it does make people come in like a waffle bar where you can have a made to order waffle with your own toppings. You can have it gluten free. So you start with that and then you go to your collaborative team activity. I like, you know, I'm not opposed to food bribes at all. No, I I think (laughs) I like waffle wins. It's a lot better than ugly sweater Friday. Yeah, no, I get that. So the next thing I want to talk about is things to avoid as you're creating these moments. And you've already told us at least one, which is don't make it, what did you call it? Like a, like producey, right? Mm -hmm. Are there any other pitfalls people should be thinking of and trying to avoid as they create these moments? Yes, there are a bunch actually, just to be totally candid. Like I mentioned earlier, the John Deere first day experience story. And I I won't retell that story now. It's in the book. And I think maybe I did a YouTube video about it too. So if you're interested, just Google John Deere first day moment. And then what I really want to tell you is what happened after that, which is when I started circulating copies of the manuscript for feedback, I heard from the CHRO of a big company. And she was like, I love this John Deere story. I think we could stand to do something like that here. It was a big conglomerate style business, but one part of it was a call center And she was thinking, like, can we do something to kind of transform the experience of those call center employees? Because it can be a tough life. And so, you know, what if we could change things by starting on the first day? So that got me excited. I'm like, hey, maybe I can get another story for the book and do some good for these people and have some fun. And so we start meeting. There's a team assembled to kind of think about this. So we start meeting on the phone and man, it's just like fireworks. We're thinking about all these great ideas. And what if we did this? And what if we did this? And And so I was super excited. And then over about the four weeks after that, as we started to approach the actual implementation deadline, they had a natural deadline because there was like a cohort of people starting at a certain time. So we were trying to get ready. And as the kind of crush of reality intruded on our brainstorming, what happened was the ideas just slowly, slowly, slowly got nickel and dimed to death. And so originally we were thinking, well, what if the the first day breakfast is like, the hotel, there's like an omelet station, or, or you were saying waffle wins. What if there's a waffle station? You know, something just cool and fun and different and customized. So if you want blueberries on your waffle and I want chocolate chips, like great. Well, 
by the end, that had been reduced down to like store-bought croissants. Those kind of like croissants that have never seen a touch of butter that you can buy like a thousand for $10, like that sort of thing. And we had some clever ideas about like an offsite lunch on the first day. Maybe you get matched up with a mentor or somebody who could kind of show you the ropes or tell you. That changed into a $10 lunch voucher for the company's cafeteria or food court or whatever it was. And as soon as I heard the word voucher pop out, I was like, I'm out. I can't commit any more of my time to this. So that story actually was very, I was really glad, despite the poor outcome for call center employees, it was very helpful to me to understand the barriers that exist in the world for the ideas in the book. And my brother and I summarized all of this in the book with what's become a kind of slogan for people who like the book, and that is, beware the soul-sucking force of reasonableness. So if there was going to be like a coffee mug slogan from the book, I think that's it. And the thing was like, that really was what was happening here. Like these people on the, it's not like the people on the phone were call center employee hating people that wanted to degrade their experience. It's just, there's a lot of stuff going on and the time of the rollout was looming and, and where's the budget going to come for, for the waffle chef and who's going to reach out. They don't have a waffle chef vendor in their, you know, vendor management system. And, and it just gets it starts to feel hard and it wasn't as much fun as like coming up with those creative ideas in the beginning. And so like step by step, what seems quote unquote reasonable and what seems scalable and what seems efficient and what seems doable can just turn what was once a Mount Everest of a peaky moment into a speed bump. And so that's the cautionary tale is because this work is often not on anybody's formal job description and doesn't have a formal budget allocated to it. And because the business wouldn't end if there wasn't a great first day experience, it can often fail to achieve liftoff. Thank you for that. That is a great, but very, very sad example. (laughs) (laughs) All right. So we're going to wrap up how we started and I'll ask you a couple more human questions. So one of the things I am personally super curious about, because I talk a lot about my career journey and how I ended up here. How did you get to the place where moments that matter is your thing? Like, did you wake up one morning and be like, you know what? I want to write a book about this with my brother. It was actually kind of a circuitous journey for this book. My brother and I wrote four books together and three of them, it was like the topic just seemed to come naturally. And then for this one, I think we had actually started maybe two other books and were actively working, you know, maybe in the third inning or something on a different book. But I remember vividly, there's actually like a moment attached to this moment's book, which is uh, on brand. We were together at Christmas. You know, he's on the West Coast and I'm on the East Coast. So we used to talk a couple times a week when we were in, in book cycle, but we would only see each other maybe once or twice. And one of those was guaranteed at Christmas. So we're in my dad's office and we're, we're brainstorming about this other book concept. And you can just kind of feel that It's like we've put so much work into it at that point that it felt really painful to give it up. You know, all the sunk cost fallacy stuff we are familiar with, but neither of us was really ready to call it. And so we just somehow got on a fit of procrastination talking about other things to avoid the real work we were supposed to do on this other book. And and somehow the phrase defining moments popped out. I don't even really remember where it came from or how or And we just started riffing on like, what is a defining moment? What makes a moment defining? And we talked about political defining moments and these moments that come to stand in for candidates. Like uh, the real old heads listening to this will remember the Michael Dukakis wearing the army helmet and how goofy he looked with that. And that became a major thing. And then George Bush Sr. supposedly expressed fascination at a UPC scanner in a grocery store and and everybody just made hay of that at how out of touch he must be. And we started talking about defining moments with products. Like my brother had heard from a BMW engineer that they found ways to juice up the sound of the, uh, when you fire up the engine, like, you know, to make it really sound growly and, and powerful. So anyway, we're just like in this trance of brainstorming about what makes moments special in your life and products at work. And it's like two hours into this, we look at each other and we're like, this is the book. 
this moments thing. This is the book. It's not this other thing. And so we come out triumphantly into the living room where our family is and we announce our new book topic. And I'll never forget, they all looked at us with this kind of relief because uh, they all secretly hated the other topic, but just were, were too kind to tell us. So that's where the idea came from. I love this story. There's so much in here. The courage to evolve strikes me as one. And definitely you came up with a winner with this book. I absolutely love the book. I own it. And for our listeners, not only I hope you hear today that the topic is a great one and it's covered very well in the book. But one of the things that you may not be picking up on, there is a sense of humor throughout the book that actually makes it really pleasurable and fun to read. So definitely, definitely recommend it. Thanks for that. Last question. Okay. And this is a fun one. So one of the things I loved about your presentation at Work Human Live was the part where you talked about kids outlining their perfect day Mm. and a little boy who did not want to bathe. Like that was part of his perfect day. (laughs) So can you tell us what you learned from what the kids wrote about their perfect day? And we would love to hear about your perfect day because I definitely have my own perfect day ideas. Mm, mm, mm. So the backstory here is maybe a year or two after the book came out, this guy came up to me at a conference and said, hey, I read the book and it actually inspired me to try something with my kids. So I got excited. I was like, well, what'd you try? And he said, I gave them an exercise to create their perfect day from start to finish. And he said, I have a seven-year-old boy and a five-year-old girl. And I told them, as long as it wasn't full of like fantastical stuff, like we're going to jet up to the moon to have a picnic or whatever. If it's stuff that we can do, your mom and I will really try to make this happen for you. And he said, but I wanted them to have some skin in the game and to really think carefully about it. So I made them write it out. Like they had to write up an agenda for the day. Like, here's what we do at each time. And so I begged him to send me these agendas I really wanted to see what they look like. And so this guy, his name was Jonathan Kraftchik, by the way, he sent me an email a couple of days later with the actual scans and they are, I wish I could show them to you that they are so brilliant. It's like the five-year-old girls, it's just a real mess. If you can imagine like five-year-old handwriting and their stuff scratched out and redone. And, but when you start digging into it, it's really this beautiful map of what she wants. And she wants to wake up and eat donuts because who doesn't? And then, uh, you know, walk the family dog and eat Chipotle for lunch and then watch the emoji movie at night. And it's so cute. And then the little boys, in some ways, is even funnier because he has a structure much like hers. He wants to go to this place called Rise that has good biscuits and then um, go get French fries and, and hot dogs for lunch. And then in the afternoon, he wants to play board games. Like, folks, this is his perfect day. And he wants to play board games with his family. Like, it's the sweetest, sweetest thing. And then, like you said, on the back of his, it was a two-pager. He talks about what's going to happen at night. And the funniest thing to me was the peak moment of this kid's perfect day was no showers. No showers. It had like a little picture of a shower nozzle with one of those no smoking style, like circle with a cross through it things on it. No showers. And I just think that's so brilliant that this guy, Jonathan Kraftchik, he told me we spend so much money saving up for Disney and doing these extravagant things. But when you just ask them, like, what does your perfect day look like? That's not what they say. They say things that are in some ways much smaller and more realizable. And I think there's something really beautiful about that. That's right. A great experience. Like so often, even with gift giving, we think about what we would like instead of what the person would like. You know what I mean? Totally. Yeah. So my perfect day involves ackee and salt fish for breakfast. I'm Jamaican. That somebody brings to me that I don't have to cook. Yes. I'm somewhere where I can hear the sound of the ocean I have the time to just read a book. I can go for a lovely hike afterwards Mm. to digest and really think about what I've read. And then I come back to oxtails and red wine. That's my perfect day. That's a pretty, I I could sign on for that. That's a good one. Yeah. I think I've definitely got some overlap with you. I I have to think more about the sequencing of everything, but I, I do know there are some critical elements, a really great cup of coffee maybe at several points of the day. So maybe several perfect cups of coffee, 
some unnecessarily elaborate fruit platter with six different kinds of exotic fruits that were all carefully peeled and prepared. I think a chance to recline maybe with the aforementioned coffee to read a book. I mean, just to recline in a chair and have a couple hours to read something special. And then the highlight would be to do something different with my ladies, my wife and my two daughters. Maybe it, maybe it's a hike or it's some new amusement park or it's some, some new thing. You know, one of the themes in the book is about novelty and, and the effects that novelty has on our memory. So it's fun to do new things with the people you love. And then maybe, maybe for dinner, I'm really on a roll now. You got me thinking. Definitely some kind of spicy Tex-Mex for dinner. Like that's going to be the, the grand finale for me. But yeah, thanks for getting me in that mental space. That's good. It was my pleasure. Thank you so much for joining us today. It has really been a pleasure chatting with you. You too. Yeah, thanks for everything. And yeah, good luck on the perfect day. (laughs) Thank you. Thank you all for listening to How We Work. For more episodes, find us on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, or wherever else you listen to podcasts. For more on WorkHuman, visit workhuman.com and follow us on social at WorkHuman. Thanks to Mike Lovett for producing, Rob Valoy for editing and mixing, and Breakmaster Cylinder for the original music. Talk to you next time.